So in the last video, we talked about life in the oceans. And life in the oceans actually influences a lot of things. For example, the amount of, of um, chemicals in the water are definitely related to life forms for, because life forms are involved in what we call biochemical nutrient cycles. For example, the nitrogen cycle. Now, the nitrogen cycle is, is it's what there's a lot of nitrogen in the atmosphere and that automatically gets transferred into the water like we talked about in, in other, in other uh, chapters. The, but then there's bacteria which actually captures that nitrogen and converts that into ammonia. Now that ammonia can actually be converted further into things like nitrates and nitrites. And then those things can actually be converted back to the atmosphere by other bacteria that do denitrification. Or the nitrates and nitrites are assimilated by life forms and used to make proteins. And so this is a little picture that shows you the biochemical nitrogen cycle and, and where the ammonia produced by the de decomposition of, of uh, because this is a byproduct of decomposition of life forms, can be transferred by ammonification into nitrates and nitrites and then transferred again by, to, by denitrification into, uh, uh, into nitrogen in the atmosphere. And remember, there are some bacteria which are called nitrogen-fixing bacteria, which are also... Uh, fixate the amount. So there you can see bacteria are very involved in the nitrogen cycle. And then plants are, are the ones which are collecting those nitrates uh, and nit uh, nitrites to make uh, proteins out of the, those materials. And so plants and algae need those things as nutrients. So when there's a high abundance of these nutrients, uh, or in other words, there's too much decomposition leading for too much nutrients or say we add fertilizer to the water which adds a lot of nutrients and then we put spray our lawns with fertilizer and then the fertilizer the rains and then the fertilizer runs into a river and then the river runs into an ocean and we blast the oceans full of these nutrients what happens is that now the algae has everything it needs to to to, to reproduce faster and you get an algae bloom or a growth of algae that covers the surface of the water with algae killing the effectively killing anything in between. One very bad type of algae, it's called a red algae, which can actually cause things like red tide. It's toxic and it will kill all the life forms in that area. And it's basically, you see here in the top right, it's basically caused by excessive nutrification or, or some, a process that's called eutrophication of the water. And you don't want that to happen. And it's for that reason that we actually limit the area of influence that humans can have on the environment by, by de determining how far into the ocean you can actually consider uh, to be part of the, uh, of the continent. So you see a picture here of the economical division of the continents and see how um, about 12 miles deep into the ocean is what most people consider part of the, the, the territory of the actual uh, country that has that. But some people consider the contiguous zone all, all the way to 24 meters under the area of influence of that, but that the content of the of the of that particular country, but that 200 meters will be the actually the area that it's called the exclusive economic zone or the area that only those that country can 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 uh, do uh, trade in that area, and and that will be the considered the limit of the actual continents. But either way, this is we talked about this when we do. Um, um, environmental science later in the year, but I just wanted to point out that we want to limit the amount of, of ocean that we can actually have control over because if we are allowed to take over the oceans, we do things like this. And remember, when you fertilize your lawn, you're actually adding ammonia and nitrates and nitrites to the water, which is going to cause eutrophication and large bloom of algae, which can actually cover the water with algae or even worse, cause things like red tide. But notice that the nitrogen cycle has everything to do with the, uh, and we learn more about this in, bi in biology next year. Um, and, and also, things like the carbon cycle are also part of, of, of life forms. And remember that uh, life forms are absorbing carbon from the atmosphere. And remember here, we talked about these guys. If the water is nutrient rich and there's a lot of carbon dioxide, you're going to get diatoms, uh, which are those uh, algae producers. So it's, if, there, uh, if there's a lot of nutrient rich water you're going to get this carbon dioxide production which will make the diatoms now and now if you have a lot of nutrient poor water you're going to have the actual promotion of carbonate 
in the water, which is actually going to increase the amount of those coccoliths or those foraminians, which are the calcium carbonate lith rich lifes, life forms. But either way, notice how the oceans are the, the amount of, of carbon dioxide dissolved in the water also changes the composition of the life in the oceans. But the life also affects that. Because the more life you have in the oceans, the more respiration is happening. The more algae you have in the oceans, the more photosynthesis is happening. Bacteria is also going to be doing decomposition of, of dead material in the water. And so de bacteria, photosynthetic life, and life forms which consume oxygen to produce carbon dioxide all play a part in the, in the carbon cycle. So you see how the life forms living in the water all play a part into the, in the, into the chemistry of the water to processes like decomposition, nitrogen fixation, ammonification, uh, nitrification, uh, photosynthesis, and even feeding nitrogen and carbon dioxide and oxygen get transferred in between the life forms of the ocean. And so the take home point from this is that life forms play with the chemistry of the water. And they also add sedimentation. Remember, we talked about this. This is a, a decomposition happening at the bottom of the ocean. Remember that decomposition is actually part of what causes the, the, the nitrogen cycle and the uh, carbon cycle as well. And life forms, like we talked about in the previous chapter, are also going to be involved in the formation of sediments and also the changing of those sediments, adding nutrients to the sediments, adding, changing the pH of the sediments, changing the amount of oxygen dissolved in the sediments, the particulates which are dissolved in the sediments. And like we saw before, the oceans can be silicon rich or carbonate rich depending if the water is nutrient poor or nutrient rich. Nutrient poor water will lead to the formation of carbonate ions which will increase the amount of foraminians and coccoliths and in the water and therefore the sedimentation will be more of these shelled animals we talked we talked about in the previous chapter but if you have a nutrient poor water and you have more silicon rich water you're going to have a more growth of diatoms and, and radiolorians which we talked about in the other chapter as well but you see when those things die they fall to the bottom and if they're not consumed and they form sedimentation so a lot of the sediment 40 percent of the sediment of the ocean is about life forms so life forms have everything to do with sedimentation as well so you see the presence of life in the ocean actually changes the the oceans all right and that's very important now the uh there are there's something important that's called uh there's an important concept where is the nutrients in the ocean well there's going to be two places with, full of nutrients. The continents, because uh, that's going to be a runoff coming from the, from the continents. You're going to have a lot of that nitrates and nitrites dissolved in the rivers. And therefore, near the continents, there's going to be a lot of nutrients, which is where most of the algae is going to be like and most of the animal life is going to be like. And you're going to have a more carbonate-rich ocean because of the nutrient-rich conditions of the water. Now, the the uh, the bottom of the ocean also has a lot of nutrients because that's a lot of everything that dies in the open water will s eventually f fall to the bottom and be decomposed by uh, by these uh, decomposers and the bottom dwellers which are breaking the material into smaller pieces and then the bacteria will, will transform that into basic nutrients but here's the thing those nutrients are now in the bottom of the water so that means that where would you find the majority of the nutrients Typically, unless there's runoff coming off the continents, the majority of the nutrients will be down here at the bottom of the water. Which means in order for the oceans to maintain its structure, you need something that's going to take the nutrients from the bottom and take it to the top. And there is actually a current that does this. Now, in order to understand this, you have to understand a little bit about um, currents. Now, I'm not going to get into too much detail about what currents are, but you need to understand that they are caused by wind. Now, the interesting thing about wind is that wind blows, it blows, it affects the surface water more than it affects the, the deep water. And so the amount of current that is, is happening at the surface is going to be different from the amount of current that happens in a deeper and deeper and deeper water. And so what you end up getting is, is, is a difference between the way the water is moving at the surface from the way the water is moving deeper and deeper and deeper. And you actually have this circulating water motion in the water where the current near the surface is going to be at an angle to the actual wind and then as you go deeper and deeper the, the angle is actually going to change and the whole idea this is happening because the wind affects the surface more than it affects the bottom water so it's going to be moving out the top water more than it's going to be moving the bottom water so that means as the water moves away 
water from the bottom is forced to arise to, to replace the water that's moving. And then, but that water at the same time is affected by as well. So it's also going to be moving to the side. So think of it this way. You have the top being moved by the wind, which adds a, a, a place for more water to replace that water that's being moved away. And so some of the bottom water is going to go rise to replace that water. At the same time, the bottom water is also being moved less by the wind, which means it's also being displaced, which means water on the bottom is also rising. When you put this all together, before I get into too much detail, you get this circulating helical uh, thing, which is called an Ekman transport, after the scientists discovered this. Now, this will be more common in the open water, and, it's, and also if the water is deeper. So out of the open ocean, you get this. You have this pattern of transport where the water actually is moving uh, and causing a column of rising water. This can even happen in the open ocean. It doesn't have to happen near the continent. And basically, because of the way the wind blows and moves the water, it creates a, a, a current that's parallel, or, or at an angle. So not parallel, at an angle to the actual wind. All right. So the surface layer is going to be moving at an angle. And if it's out in the deep water, it's going to be a 45 degree angle, which means the net water movement is actually at a 90 degree angle with the wind itself. What, is, what that means is that if the wind is blowing in a certain direction, it will force the water to move in a 90 degree direction in the opposite way. So what's happening here? For example, if the wind moves like this, that will cause the water to move per, in a 90 degree angle to that because of this, of this spiral that's happening in the, in the water, it's going to make the water move that way. Now, if the water is hitting, going this way, when it hits the continent, it's going to be forced to go down. That's called downwelling. Now, if the transport happens in the opposite way, in other words, if the wind is blowing the opposite direction and blowing uh, in, this way, then the transport will be opposite, and nine, again, in a 90-degree angle, but it will be pulling water away from the continent, and that water must be replaced. So that means the water from the bottom is going to be rising to replace the water that's moving away from the continent. And this is causing a current that's called upwelling. Now, you don't need to actually understand what's happening here in detail, but you do need to understand that because of wind, and because of the way the wind affects the surface more than it affects the deep water, you get this spiral, which is called the Ackman transport. And because of Ackman transport, the water ends up moving at a 90 degree angle to the actual direction of the wind, which causes the water to hit the continents or go away from the continents. Now, if the water hits the continents, you get downwelling. But if the water is going away from the continents, you actually get upwelling. Okay, and this can actually happen in the middle of the open ocean if the wind is affecting one area more than the other. So, see, for example, here, here the wind is, is, is throwing the water that way. Here, the wind is throwing the water that way. And so, what you had is a middle that is losing water, and the water is going away from that middle, which means the bottom water gets to rise to replace the water that is leaving from that middle. Now, what that means is that anytime you have this upwelling, either in the open ocean or near the continents. What that means is it's going to carry nutrients from that are present into deep water. It's going to get, get those nutrients and carry them to the top. And now you're going to get nutrients, which were part of the decomposition process, per, uh, develop these nutrients. Now these nutrients are going to be coming up to the top and replacing the, the, uh, the water that was nutrient poor up here. And so now you're going to get a lot of these life forms growing in that water because of the rich nutrients which are blasting that area. And so, I know it got confusing, so let's just do one more time, a quick review. If you have a wind hitting the surface, it will affect the bottom water less than the top water, which will displace the top water more than it will displace the bottom water. That creates a circulation pattern or a helical pattern of ascending water in the bottom of the ocean. So at different depths, you have different directions of the wind because the water affects the wind the, uh, a different wind hits the top more than the bottom so it will cause the surface water to move in a different direction than the deep water will be moving and that will create a net movement usually at a 90 degree angle to the actual wind pattern and so that will cause the, the water to go either towards the continents or away from the continents and when that happens away from the continents the water must be replaced, which actually creates an upwelling that, that brings nutrients from the bottom of the ocean up. 
Now, the actual degrees on how many 9 degrees or 45 degrees depends on how deep the water is. This only works at a 9 degree angle if the water is very deep. So if the water is shallower, it won't happen like that. But the point is, upwelling is a current that brings nutrients from the bottom to the surface and allows life to grow near the continents.